The Bible is what you would call a historical narrative. And that means that the Bible is made up of stories that are true historical events from Genesis in the Garden of Eden right up unto the Apostle John on the island of Patmos receiving the visions of the revelation of Jesus Christ. These events of the people and the places are true historical events. But the Bible is written as a story. That's why we call it a historical narrative. Very often you'll see in our story, wherever we are, whichever book, that there are markers put in the story to give some evidence for dating the events of the chapter. Here in Genesis chapter 14, the historical marker is the reign of nine certain kings in the ancient Middle East from Canaan to the land of Shinar, the area back near to ancient Babel. The date of chapter 14 is around 1900 BC, which means that even though we're only in Genesis chapter 14, we're already halfway through the Old Testament as far as dating goes. Creation takes place in around 4000 BC, and by the time we're introduced to Abraham in Genesis chapter 11, we've already covered over 2000 years. And now we're at around 1900 B.C. And I mention this so that you'll notice the emphasis that God places on creation compared to the emphasis that God puts on his personal, intimate relationship to men. And I'm speaking of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then the nation of men that are called the people of God, the Israelites. People are far more of an interest to God than how the rocks and the trees all came into being. It reads in Genesis 14.1, And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elasar, Shedder Loamar, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, the king of Adma, and Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. Zoar was the city. All these were joined together in the vale of Sidim, which is the Salt Sea, or the Dead Sea, near the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Twelve years they served Chedor Loamar, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. Here we have a list of nine different kings. Four kings from the east near Shinar, or Shinar, I, I say it different ways. <laughs> so Shinar from the area around Babel, and then five kings from the Vale of Siddim, as it reads in the King James Version of, of the Bible. The, the name Siddim simply means the plain. This is speaking of the marshy area near the Salt Sea, which is near the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the word veil in the King James Version of the Bible means valley. And if you don't know the history of our own county here in Southern California, this whole region from Fullerton all the way down to San Juan Capistrano was once called Vallejo de Santa Ana after the Gaspar de Portola expedition of 1769, of which Friar Junipero Serra was part, as well as Sergeant Jose Antonio Yorba, and that's where we get the name Yorba Linda, also Jose Manuel Nieto. These men helped to, to found this place coming up from Mexico. And we who live in Orange County live in a vale also. Before it was called Orange County, the whole area was called Santa Ana Valley. This is where the name Valley High School comes from, from the Santa Ana Valley. So what we have here in our chapter are two major powers who have come against each other for battle. The four kings from the east against the five kings 
from the valley. The kings of the valley were really comprised of the kings from the five cities around Sodom and Gomorrah. And this is the first mention of any kings in the Bible at all. Nimrod, he was just mentioned as a mighty hunter before the Lord. That's when the cities and the nations had only begun to form just after the flood and just after the Tower of Babel. From this point forward in chapter 14, this pattern of kings and battles and wars now becomes the norm throughout all the nations of the earth throughout history. Men try to make their claim to lands and to peoples from here on out. And you know that war has never ceased between the nations of the earth at any time from this point forward. The nations, at least in some part of the earth, have always been at war. Just within our recent history, for example, at no time during the past 200 years has there been any gap in time where there was peace on earth. The world is always at war. If it's not nation against nation, then it's been a civil war within the same nation as kingdoms are divided against themselves. It's interesting that the number of years listed in verse 4, the numbers 12 and 13, have a symbolic significance. 12 is commonly known as the number of government as the 12 patriarchs or the 12 apostles who happen to be somewhat of God's government. These nine kings had a confederacy with one another for 12 years. And I imagine that there was some tension between them for those 12 years, lots of sharpening of the spears. But then the number 13 is also known as the number of rebellion. Lots of Gangsters have the number 13 tattooed on their bodies. It reads in verse 4 that in the 13th year, whatever peace agreement they had, it was called off and all these nations were going to battle against one another. It doesn't seem as though much has changed in the last 4,000 years in this area of the Middle East. All this is taking place in the plain of Jordan, on the west end of Israel, near the Dead Sea. I found a detailed number of Palestinian rocket and mortar attacks on Israel from just this year alone, from 2012. As of last month in November, over 2,200 and 56 rockets have been launched at Israel from Gaza since January 2012, just to last month in November. All the attacks originated in the Gaza Strip, and if you think about it, that's nearly seven rockets a day, every day, since January 1st, being fired at Israel. It doesn't seem as though much has changed in the last 4,000 years. John Phillips writes in his commentary on Genesis chapter 14 concerning these restless kings and these restless nations, he writes, and I quote, There was no thought of God, no repentance, no prayer, no spiritual awakening, just the formation of alliances and the outfitting of armies. It all seems so remarkably up to date, end quote. In verse 5, it reads, And in the fourteenth year came Chedor lo Amar, and the kings that were with him, and smote the Rephims in Ashtoreth, Karnaim, and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Emims in Shava Kiriathaim. And so now the eastern kings are on the attack. Verse 6, And the Horites in their Mount Seir unto Elparan, which is by the wilderness, and they returned and came to En Mishpat, 
which is Kadesh, at the south end of Canaan, and smote all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazazontamar. Hazazontamar. <laughs> I practiced on that. That's, I got to practice on all these names. And there went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma and the king of Zeboim and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar, and they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddim. And so they're all fighting now. With Chedor Loamar, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, the king of Elisar, four kings with five, or four against five. Now you would think that the kings of the plain or the kings of those five cities around Sodom and Gomorrah would have had the advantage in this battle. They were fighting on their home turf, for one. They didn't have to travel anywhere of great distance for this battle. It was right there in their own land. Plus, they had the best access to their ammunition. If they were running out of arrows, their supply is right at hand. Also, they knew the country better than the armies of the east, so they might have the advantage there also. And I don't know if they outnumbered the kings of the east or not, but this war seems to favor the home team. <laughs> Maybe. In verse 10, it reads, And the vale of Siddim was full of slime pits. And I think this slime was bitumen the tar substance that Noah used for pitch to waterproof the ark, and also what Nimrod had used for the mortar with his bricks to build the Tower of Babel. And there were all these tar pits in the valley. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there in the slime pits, and they that remained fled to the mountains." So even though it would appear at first that they might have had some sort of advantage in this battle, they got their cans kicked <laughs> and they ended up in the pits. And some ran off in, into the mountains, which is, uh, I think, a fitting defeat for these kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. They were morally filthy in their hearts and now they were filthy in defeat, falling into these slime pits. Verse 11, And the kings of the east took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. For they took the food as a reward for their victory in the battle. That would be the victuals. And they also took anything that was of value. They plundered the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. So Lot was captured also. In this story here, Lot is the picture of the backslider. Men who once walked with the Lord in an obvious good and fruitful relationship with the Lord, and then they depart back into living in some sort of sin or a very worldly lifestyle, these wayward sons are what you would call backsliders. A backslider is a true son of God. He's a true believer. He's had a true, vital, born-again experience, and God has saved him. He is saved. But by looking at his lifestyle, you wouldn't be able to tell that he was saved because he's lost so much ground. He's slidden backwards. The term backslider is a biblical term. It's found in Jeremiah in chapter 8, verses 5 through 7, it reads, Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? 
Everyone turned to his course as the horse rusheth into battle. And horses, they don't think, they just go. Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming, but my people know not the judgment of the Lord. Yikes. <laughs> As true saints of God, we don't want to be in a backslidden state. When it comes to our relationship with the Lord, there is no middle ground. You can't say that you're just in neutral gear. You're either growing or you're shrinking. You're either drawing nearer to God or you're moving further away from him. You're either moving forwards or you're moving backwards. And, th and this applies to all of us, no matter how long you've been a believer. Either you're moving forwards or you're sliding backwards. And at one time, Lot was in fellowship with godly men. He was in the company of the father of faith, faithful Abraham. And they were following the Lord together, and the Lord was blessing his life abundantly. Even his cattle and his herdmen increased in the place of fellowship and blessing. But Lot had chosen to pitch his tent towards the plain of Sodom. Lot must have been a backslider in his heart, Already, because when he was given the choice, he didn't only go towards worldly cities, he went towards some of the morally worst cities in all of the land. This is Las Vegas. Lot went towards what would be the ancient city of Amsterdam in Holland, some of the worst cities morally in the world. Then it reads that Lot had drawn near to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He went towards them at first, but then he parked himself right next to them. He wanted to be as close to the action as he possibly could. And there's a sin nature in all of us, no doubt but we still have the ability to make good choices, especially for us who are believers. The true saint has a new nature that's been born from above. We have been given power from on high to be able now to turn from sin and walk in righteousness. Lot wasn't forced to go to Sodom. No believer is ever forced into sin. We sin because we get enticed and then we choose to sin. And I've said this several times before, but the sin that we struggle with the most is the sin that we like the best. Lot drew near and he parked himself next to Sodom. And then finally, it reads in verse 12 that Lot dwelt in Sodom. And that word for dwelt is defined as to inhabit or to abide, to make that place your abiding home where you constantly live. And let me ask you, are you at home in sin? If you are, you won't feel at home in church if you live in sin? Or are you at home in the Lord? If so, you'll be a nervous wreck in sin. If you abide in Christ, if your heart is Christ's home, you cannot live in sin. Lot dwelt in Sodom. Back in the last chapter in Genesis 13, in verse 18, it reads that Abraham or Abram dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. And remember, Mamre and 
Hebron means association and strength, or association and fatness. Abram dwelt in the place of communion with God and also in the place of the blessing of God. Fatness. <laughs> Which was just the opposite of Lot. Lot dwelt in Sodom, which means burning. That's the definition of the name Sodom, a regular hell on earth. After Lot was in prison by the victors of this battle in the plain, it reads in verse 13, back to Genesis 14, 13, And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, and brother of Aner. These were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. And I think that anyone who has walked with the Lord for some time has had a friend, a brother or a sister who's like Abram here in this story. Abram went and got Lot and snatched him back out of the hand of the enemy. And I love God's provision in this story. There just happened to be one that had escaped the battle. There might have been more than one person who had escaped from becoming captive to the kings of the east. But this one who had escaped, this one, he knew that Lot had an affiliation with Abram. And he went to Abram and told him that Lot was in bondage. And Abram could have just been indifferent about the whole thing. He could have just said something like, well, I'm not surprised. I told him, but he wouldn't listen. Serves him right for moving over there next to Las Vegas. <laughs> but that's not what Abram said. Abram didn't say anything derogatory about Lot whatsoever. It reads in verse 14 that when Abram heard that his brother, that's how it's worded, his brother was taken captive. He armed his servants and they went after them. This is the same herdsmen mentioned in our last study. These men are farmers. They're cattle rustlers. And he armed all 318 of them and they went after the armies of the kings of the east while it was still dark and they smote them. Or what that means is that they kicked their cans <laughs> all up and down the city of Hobah by Damascus, which is up near Syria, about 153 miles away from Hebron. This was not a, a quick fix, nor was it something easy for Abram to do. This took a lot of effort. And Abram went and restored Lot. Abram also restored Lot's possession. But I, I like the greater part of this story is that Lot himself was restored. In verse 16, it reads that he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. And you know, I... I would pray, Lord, give us more friends like Abram, faithful men who fight for their brothers and their sisters. Another thing I like about Abram's attitude here is that Abram's attitude turned into Abram's actions. He was a man of action. Like I said, he wasn't indifferent about the surrounding problems. He knew that there were real problems in the world and that Lot was tangled up right in the middle of them. 
He knew where Lot had been dwelling. He knew that there was a large homosexual community right there across the plain of Jordan. He knew all about the corrupt politics and the wars and the rumors of wars. Abram didn't just pray and hope that all these problems would go away. He prayed, no doubt. He constantly walked before the Lord in faith, and I'm sure he tried to live at peace with all men as much as was in him. After all, he dwelt in Canaan along with the Amorites, with the brother of Eshcol and the brother of Anar. And these were confederate with Abram. Much like Jesus, he walked in this world among sinners. He ate with them and he lived among them. But in his personal life, he was unsullied by their lives. Whether they were moral or whether they were sinners, Abram was determined to live a life of faith before God who had set him apart to be his own. And when the problems of politics and war and captivity came and landed on his doorstep, Abram took action. He could have just sent a note along with that servant that had escaped from the kings of the east, along with a generous sum of money for a ransom. Abram was very rich, and he could have just offered to pay Lot's bail and bailed him out of that mess without getting too much involved with it himself. Just let Lot go free. I, I've done my part. Here's some money. I'll just drop some money on it, but I don't want to get too involved. Abram felt that he was already involved. And Abram would have answered Cain's question at the beginning when he asked God, am I my brother's keeper? Abram would have said, yes, I am. I am my brother's keeper. And so he physically went to where the need was. He took some servants with him because the problem was a big problem. But he went. And he was, it wasn't quick. It wasn't easy. The odds didn't look too good on the surface for Abram. I mean, 318 farmers against the four kings of the east and their armies. On the surface, it may have looked like this was going to be impossible. But what's impossible with men is possible with God. In fact, all things are possible with God. You know, people won't get saved unless you tell them about Jesus. And Christians won't get back into fellowship unless you go to them and tell them that they're in bondage and that they need to return. Drag them by the hair if you need to. No, we don't want to do that. Actually, there's a good verse for restoring a brother to the faith. It's found in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. It reads, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And the key word in that verse is the word restore. Restore. It means to mend that which has been broken or to fix that which needs repaired. Sometimes we think, I, I know I do, that the hammer fixes everything. <laughs> and I just need to give them a hard time and be harsh and tell them how wrong they are and that they need to repent and quit sinning. Quit sinning so much. Right? <laughs> And that's why he says we need to consider ourselves lest we also be tempted to think of ourselves as being so high and mighty because we're in fellowship. And also be careful not to indulge in their sins while I'm trying to rescue them. If my weakness is alcohol, 
then I don't need to go to the bar and try to rescue people down there at the bar. That would be too much of a temptation for me. I'll pray for them and I'll catch them on the phone or I'll go to their house, but I need to be careful. You know, I love that Abram didn't just sit home and watch TV and think that the world was going to save itself. It'll minister to itself while I sit here and watch friends for the thousandth time. No, Abram didn't just throw up a prayer here and there for the world in general and then think that that was going to actually do something. I, I know he prayed. But he went to where the need was and he fought for the people who were in bondage. Abram would go to battle for his brothers. And, and this isn't a macho thing either. You know, like, Raw, let's, let's take the city for the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Abram did what was reasonable in the opportunity that he was given. One time in my own life, I was, I was in sin. Just once. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just giving you an example of one time. So one time, I, I was in sin, and I had been a Christian for a couple years. <laughs> and I'd already taught Bible studies, and uh, I got involved in something that I had no business being involved in. And my strength, it was, it was draining. And I, I felt terrible for what I was doing. But I stayed in this bondage for several months. And I remember a, a lady down at the church at, at Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa who knew me very well, and she knew this other person. And she figured out what we were doing. And so she gave me this greeting card. She just gave me a card. And I, I can't remember if she wrote anything else in the card, but she did write the scripture reference for one verse. And the verse was Psalm 107, verse 19. So I went to my Bible and I read it. And it reads, Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. And that's all I needed. She was like Abram. I'm sure she prayed for me, but then she didn't just keep her sword in its sheath. She engaged in the battle with just a card, just a note sent to me from God through my sister. And I'll be honest with you, I'm being very honest, that verse changed my life. I was about to make a bigger mess of things, and that verse changed my heart big time. It broke me, and I repented, and I got out of that sin. Abram fought for the life of his dear brother, Lot. And here's what happened right after the victory. In Genesis 14, 17, it reads, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after he returned from the slaughter of Chedor the Omer. You can see why they shortened his name to just to Omar. <laughs> and all the kings that were with him at the valley of Shava, which is the king's dale, and that means his dwelling place, the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And he's speaking of that seed that would come after Abram. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. So you know it was a work of the Lord, those 318 servants and Abram going up for the battle. It was the Lord that gave him the victory. And he, or Abram, gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And here we're introduced to this other king, a tenth king in our chapter. His name is 
Melchizedek, king of Salem. And Salem is a reference to Jerusalem. The name Salem means peace. And that's why he's called the king of peace. Another word for peace is the word shalom. It's like Salem, but shalom is still used today as a greeting by the Jews. Shalom, my friend. It's a way to say hello and goodbye. The name Jerusalem doesn't appear in the Bible until the book of Joshua in chapter 10. The name Jerusalem means the teaching of peace. This is the first time that a priest is mentioned in the Bible also. Chapter 10 has the first mention of kings, the first mention of wars, and now the first mention of a priest. Melchizedek was the priest of the Most High God. That too is a name for God that Abram hadn't known before. In Hebrew, the name is Elion, and Elion means the Most High God, which would be a very proper name for God in this chapter since we're looking at the strength of of the kings of the earth and their battles to prove who has the most power or who could usurp the most authority or which king could have the most dominance in the world. And then to answer that question, it's made pretty clear by the name of God, Elion, that it's the most high God. He is the highest supreme ruler of heaven and earth. Our God is a king of kings. Now, another question that you might ask here is where in the world did this Melchizedek come from? And who is this person, Melchizedek? He seems to have appeared out of nowhere. How come nothing is said of him before this battle and nothing is said of him after the battle? At least throughout the rest of the book of Genesis, He's not mentioned again. Is he a real king in the earth? Or is this another appearance of Christ Jesus himself in a bodily form? Remember last week I had mentioned that different times Christ appeared and they're called Christophanies in the Old Testament. And there is a brief mention of Melchizedek in Psalm 110. It's prophetic in nature because it's speaking there in the Psalms about the priesthood of Christ, Jesus, in King David's future. David wrote Psalm 110. His name is only mentioned twice in the Old Testament, here in Genesis chapter 14, and then one time again in Psalm 110. And the commentary, though, on Melchizedek is found in the book of Hebrews. If you want to turn there to the book of Hebrews, chapter 6. So starting in Hebrews 6.20, it reads, Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness. That's what the name Melchizedek means, king of righteousness. And after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now here you would almost think that Paul is talking about Melchizedek, that he is without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God. Or you would think that he is Jesus himself, because that is a description of, of Jesus, but I think he's mixing the type of who Melchizedek is along together with Jesus. He's comparing the priesthood of Melchizedek with the priesthood of Jesus. 
and Melchizedek was like Jesus. There's no genealogy before him. Some people think that Melchizedek was possibly Shem, who was one of Noah's sons that came off of the ark. But we know the line of Shem. Melchizedek was probably just a man who was a believer who God had spoken to, and he became the king, and he also was a, a priest. So he was a king and a priest, and that's just like Christ Jesus. He probably wasn't Jesus, but he was a unique king in that his name is King of Righteousness, and his origin is Salem, so he's King of Salem or King of Peace, and his position is Priest of the Most High God. Melchizedek was simply a type of, of Jesus by name, by origin, and by position. A great type, no doubt, but he was only a picture of Christ, a preview of the true priest who was to come. And it's a great preview to help us to understand a little bit more of who Jesus is in name, in origin, and position. But Melchizedek was a type. Again in Hebrews uh, chapter 7, verse 4, it reads, Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren though they come out of the loins of Abraham. And the word tithe here, because Abram gave a tithe to Melchizedek, the word tithe means tenth. It's the Hebrew word for tenth. Abram gave a tenth of all he had to God through Melchizedek. He actually considered, Abram considered, everything that he had as belonging to God and being given to Abram from God. So he was simply giving God back the tenth part of what belonged to God already. And when we give our tithes today, we do the same. We give God what belongs to him in the first place. Giving is an act of gratitude and it's also an act of faith. When we're stingy, then we're not trusting in the Lord. When we give, we prove that we trust in him, that everything we have came from his hand, and that we're showing our faith by our dedication, just as Abram did in this story also. And listen, you're never going to outgive God. <laughs> and we shouldn't just think of money as what we give to God either. We should be giving the three T's. You guys know what those are? We should be giving our time, our talent, and our treasure. The person who gives himself to God is the person who's received so much from God, he feels as though he is so blessed that he gives out of the abundance of what God's already given to him. We don't give reluctantly. We give cheerfully because God has given us so much. Hebrews 7, 6, he said, But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. And so the whole point Paul is making here is that the priesthood of Melchizedek is greater than the priesthood of Aaron and the Levites who were priests according to the law. 
Melchizedek is a greater priest in that he receives the tithes of the lesser. That's why Abram tithed to Melchizedek. And so they can't say that the Levitical priesthood is the greatest because they tithe through the loins of Abram to Melchizedek, who is a type, a picture of Jesus Christ, the priest Jesus. Melchizedek is greater than Abram in that the greater receives the tithes of the lesser. That's why we tithe to God. It's an act of faith. We're humbling ourselves before God and giving him what rightfully belongs to him. And listen, God does not need your money, but the church does. And the priesthood did. And that's why God set up the priesthood so that the priest who ministers in that office would live off of the tithes as the priest himself then would feed the people with the word of God. And the people would give to God so that the priests could have their living. It was like this cycle, this exchange. But they were both doing what they did for the Lord. And it's the same with the congregation and the church still today. If the people don't give their tithes, we won't have a church building. We could meet at the park, <laughs> but we won't have a church. And if the pastor is not feeding the congregation with the good word of God, then they won't come and give. It's a good system. It's the system that God has set forward. And like I said, you can never outgive God. Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all he had, but Melchizedek gave Abram bread and wine. And you might think bread and wine, big deal. Abram worked so hard for what he gave, but all he got in return was bread and wine. Bread and wine were obviously prophetic. Speaking of the body and the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It reads in Matthew 26, 26 through 30. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks, that would be the wine, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you that I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives, you know, I would have loved to have heard that hymn that they sung together in the upper room. One day we'll hear God singing. Do you know that? In Zephaniah 3.17 it reads, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. God will sing to us one day. Awesome. <laughs> That's going to be great. Abram gave of his abundance to the Lord. He just a tenth. He gave of his abundance. He just skimmed off the top. But Jesus gave his life for Abram. And he gave his all for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left its crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Some people would say that Melchizedek was Jesus because Jesus said, Abram saw my day, or Abraham saw my day, and he was glad. 
But I think when Jesus said that, it was a reference to when Abraham took his son, his only son, to the top of Mount Moriah, and he offered him there as a sacrifice unto the Lord. He saw the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in faith. He knew God would fulfill his promise in him, even if he had to raise his own son from the dead. That's why Jesus said that. Abraham saw my day, and he was glad. I don't think it's talking about his encounter with Melchizedek. But this is merely a type. If Melchizedek, the king of Salem, was a type of Christ, the son of God, then Bara, the king of Sodom, would be a type of Satan. And the name Bara means son of evil. These names they pick for their kids. Yeah, let's name him Son of Evil. It's a great name. I had some friends who were, well, we were punk rockers together, but, you know, as we were getting older, having our own kids, I remember a friend of mine, he was a pretty dark guy, he named his son Damien because that's like the devil, and he wanted his kid to be like him, demonic. So it's not surprising. Bara, Son of Evil. And the king of Sodom met Abram and asked for the souls of the people whom Abram had gathered. He also offered Abram the loot from the battle, from the victory of the battle. He said, you give me the souls and you can take the loot. And Satan always does that. He wants us to trade with him. Listen, what will you trade for the souls of other men? And does Satan have an easy task with you? Is it easy for him to knock you out of ministry and out of being an intercessor for other men's souls? Right off the bat, Abram, he didn't say anything. When he heard that his brother was in bondage, he went right away. He put on the sword and he went into battle. I think we go into battle through prayer and even a, a simple act like giving a greeting card with a scripture on it. Do something, something to show that we care, that God loves people. But what will you trade for the souls of other men? And what will you exchange for your time, for your talent, and for your treasure? Being given to Satan instead of being given to God. Jesus said in Matthew 8, 36 and 37 for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul what's the trade and satan always wants to make trades he does we don't want to trade with satan we want to submit ourselves to god completely and give him everything it all belongs to him you know, when these kings came out to Abram, it was like on one shoulder he had the little angel, and then on the other shoulder he had the little devil. And they were both vying for his heart. In verse 22, Genesis 14, 22, And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God. See, he just, he just heard that name. And that was enough. The, the priest blessed him. He just heard the name Elion, and he used it against the king of Sodom, the possessor of heaven and earth. That's what the priest had told him. Melchizedek said, Abram, possessor of heaven and earth. He said, no, God, the most high God, the king of kings, possessor of heaven and earth. So I've lifted up my hands to him that I will not take from you a thread even to a shoe latchet. I don't even want a shoelace from the spoil of this battle. And that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich, save only that which the young man have eaten and the portion of the men which went with me 
Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. And I love it that these men who had a confederacy with Abram, they went with him. Let them take their portion. Abram told the king of Sodom, I don't want anything from you. You can keep it. All that I am is because God has made me this way. And all that I have, it's because he gave it to me. I'm blessed of the Lord. I don't need any of your enticements. Oh, man. I, I pray that this church would be filled with these type of men and this type of a, a woman that has this kind of heart that just says, I don't want anything to do with any of it. I want to fully give myself to the Lord. He's given me so much. He's given me so much. I want to give all that I have to him. Not just a tenth, everything. Everything to the Lord. Now, of course, you got to pay your rent. So <laughs> that's why you give a tenth of your treasure. And you got to go to sleep. That's why you don't give 100% of your time to, I don't know, clean the rug or <laughs> make the coffee or whatever. But you get the point, right? Is that we live our lives for Jesus. We dwell in Christ. We don't dwell in sin. We're not enticed by Satan. We are enticed, but we don't give in to his enticements to where we're living in Sodom. We give ourselves unto the Lord because he gave everything that he had for us.